you stand with, me for, stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We have been in the book of Timothy. Uh, we're taking a week off from Timothy. Hope that doesn't disappoint anyone too much. Um, I'm joking because you don't, probably didn't read ahead. You should read ahead, by the way. One of the things I learned in seminary is that if you actually read the books, it's a lot more interesting to listen to the lesson that they're teaching. I didn't understand that in college. I didn't like to read in college. I finally got to a topic that I was interested in, and I read ahead. And I read ahead mainly because I got, and Brandon can attest to this, you get to the last, the test, and they say, did you read all the book? And you're going, man, I'm in seminary. I cannot lie here. Um, what is that? So you learn to read very quickly. Um, but let's read now from the book of Acts, chapter 2, the early days of the church. You remember the book of Acts, uh, Luke writes to Otheophilus, and he's telling him the story of uh, the, the second piece of what happened after the gospel of Luke. And he says, here's how the church went forth. Let me tell you about it. And he gets to chapter 2, and he says this beginning in verse 38. We're going to read 38 through 40. Peter says this. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. In many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Here ends the reading of God's word. Father, thank you for your word. Do not let it return void, but let it flourish in our lives to transform us today by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I love right here. He says, uh, yeah, he said a lot of other stuff. Luke's like, yeah, he went on forever, but this was the important stuff that you really wanted to know. Peter was a true pastor, just kept talking, all right? Let's, uh, let's talk about baptism. So today we have the joy of communicants coming to, they're not coming right now, they're coming, at, I didn't want to confuse them because I told them when I say communicants, y'all come up, not yet. Um, they're coming after the sermon. They will come to, uh, they're being received as communing members and we have one among our midst who was not uh, baptized as a, an infant and so she will be baptized uh, as a, a, received into the church through receiving the sign and the seal of baptism. So what an exciting day this is for us. Like you look around, you go, why is the church here? It's to pass on the faith of Christ to the next generation, to see it continue to propagate. Uh, but we need to understand baptism. If you go talk to various people today, you'll get a lot of different discussions about what baptism is. A lot of times it gets into the, uh, I know it's not everyday talk. You're not like sitting there with your best friend going, hey, what do you think about baptism? But if you get into church circles and start thinking about it, People will start talking about immersion and sprinkling and dunking. And, and you saw, saw the video that went around to some Eastern or, or whatever it was. He had the kid by the ankles and splashing his head in the water. Not sure what that was. CGI. Cre I don't know. It was funny, though. Um, but I want us to understand what Scripture teaches about it. And, of course, it's what I believe Scripture teaches about it. But I've got a long history of, of uh, Reformed covenantal churches behind me. That, that I'm standing upon and I'm really stealing from because I didn't come up with any of this. Uh, but what is baptism? We will say that baptism is a sign and a seal of the new covenant. Okay. I want to back up and really set the ground. I wanna, we're going to get to that and talk about that, but I want to set some foundational elements first. A uh, year and a half ago, October of 22, we were in Turkey. And the city of Ephesus is in Turkey. This is the, the walkway, the entrance to the city. A marble, you can see all the pillars that were there. This had to have been very grand. It went out to the bay. No longer there. The silt and soot has pushed it miles outward. Um, they're actually talking now. They just, I think it was last year I saw where they have a commitment to come in and actually scrape that out and return the, the old uh, city, back, return the bay and the water back up to where it was um, so they can get cruise ships in there. But, you know, it's a little different than what Paul had. 
But if you came to Ephesus, you came by sea, you would enter in here. And you would be walking along, and you might look down and see a symbol like this etched into or and somehow into the marble and our tour guides literally his name was tour guy his last name um it wasn't tour guide it was really strange um but he and, and the others that were there were members and pastors of the church and they said this was a symbol of the christian symbol they said they did this on the walkway in to allow people to tell people as a sign that hey there are christians here in this community and so as you're walking along you're in the Roman Empire you're in one of the bigger cities of Rome and Ephesus you know the the reputation for Ephesus is a city of trade but it's, it's not a great city morally and not really a Christian city by any stretch of the imagination you're coming in and you see that sign you go ah oh, my people are here my people are here signs signs communicate a message to us we've been talking about with all of our building expansion one of the next steps is to get a sign we want a sign on the end of the building that tells people who we are what's our name we want a sign on the bathrooms men and women we want a sign on the Sunday school rooms youth room uh, adult Sunday school room nursery why so that if you're new you go oh that must be where the youth regularly and consistently meet or oh I am a male I should go into this bathroom versus this bathroom and I realize the political controversy I stepped in with those statements, but I don't really care. Um, but signs tell us something. They communicate something to us. And when it's a sign of a group, something that the group has taken hold of and said, this is our sign that represents us, it unites those within the group when they look to that sign and go, this, is, this represents us. This is a symbol of who we are. And it also does something else. It sets that group of people apart from everyone else who doesn't take a hold of that sign and claim that group for themselves. You want some examples? The most obvious one in our state. You see the signs, logos of our favorite schools. It's a sign of one's affiliation. Each of you looks at one of those and thinks, those are my people. And you look to the other side and you go, I hate them. Well, maybe not hatred. My wife does, but not everybody else. Um, but but we, we get it. We understand what a sign is. We understand the importance of it. It, it. it unites people together when you see it. If you attended that location for school, you might have memories. of It, it brings up everything that that school stood for for you, what you embraced about it, what you loved about it. You see, this sign, who might fly this flag at their home or their business? It's the Star of David. It's this flag of Israel, the Israelite flag. You would go, ah, that represents people who are united into the nation of Israel. Signs are important. We use them all the time everywhere. God also uses signs. You may know the story of Abraham, of Abram, is when he started. Uh, God came to Abram and said, hey, I need you to leave the city of Ur. This was after the Tower of Babel where the world had come together and he had separated them out because they had become too, for, for all the various reasons, they had kind of collected together and their sin was growing. And, and, and he said, I'm going to spread you out. And he says, okay, now I'm going to Abram. Abram, I want you to leave this place and you're going to be mine. And I'm going to do some fantastic and amazing things for you. And I'm going to let your offspring, eventually he tells him through Genesis 12 up to 17 or on, I'm going to let them be a blessing to the entire world. Abram's going, wow. You can imagine a good old Alabama boy going, hell, heck yeah, let's do this. Well, let's do this. Come on, where are we going? And, and Abram probably didn't have that southern accent. But he followed God. And you go, man, Abraham must have been so strong to leave his family. And he just trusted God and he gets put up on a, cat, on, on a pedestal. But what did Abraham say so many times? He goes, okay, God, I've done this, but how do I know that you're going to do these things? How do I know? That question's loaded. How do I know you're capable? How do I know you're able? How do I know you haven't changed your mind because of something that I've done? How do I know 
you just all of a sudden changed your mind because you're a shifting God and you found a people better than me. How do I know that you will make me a great nation and that you will bless me and make my name great so that I will be a blessing? How do I know? Well, we get forward and Abram receives uh, a sign. If you go to Genesis 15, first of all, God makes a covenant. Uh, if you're not familiar with covenant theology, it's a, it's a way of reading Scripture that says, hey, Scripture is a, a single story from beginning to end, and it's a story of redemption. Man fell, and here is how God worked in history to bring about man's redemption, lifting them back up from the state from which they fell. And that's the entire story of Scripture. And what God does is he, he, what happened when Adam and Eve sinned? They were blinded. They thought their eyes were opened. Satan, the serpent, said, you will see things that he's not. Why are you trusting him? Why are you following him? You will see good and evil. You will have the knowledge of everything. You will have true knowledge. And what it actually did to them is it blinded them. It killed them, actually spiritually dead, unable to see the kingdom of God, unable to recognize God as the creator of the universe, unable to see all of the things around them in the light and truth of God. And he says they've been blinded. So God came and said, I need to communicate who I am to them. And so he made a series of covenants with people throughout time. And he recorded those in the scriptures. And a covenant is a commitment between two people, two parties usually. Um, the Old Testament word for covenant is to cut a covenant because there was often the, the sign and, and, and sealing of that covenant was they would kill an animal, sprinkle the blood around, as oftentimes is a sign that if you break this covenant or if I do, one of us dies. And so there were serious consequences to the covenants. God came and made a covenant. And he said, I'm committing myself to you, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David. He would commit himself to a group of people. And through that covenant promise, he would show his faithfulness. He would always deliver upon what he promised to deliver upon. The Mosaic covenant was the, the law. And it was saying, if you obey this law, you will be blessed. If you don't, you will be cursed. Now, it's not a standalone covenant different from Abraham. It was really underneath the covenant of redemption. He promised Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And it's through these people. And the first thing he does to bless them is he, he opens their eyes to their need for a Savior. Because they went, we can't keep this law. Now, Abraham's long dead by this point, but we can't keep this law of Moses. What are we to do? God has promised through our ancestors that he would bless us, but this law says we're doomed. And then he brings in the covenant of David. I will have uh, uh, my offspring, your offspring, David, will sit on the throne forever. He slowly, over time, through commitments to the people, revealing the need for a Savior and that Jesus would be coming. Every one of these covenants, I'm not giving you a full workup of covenant theology, just a very lightweight touching so you understand the idea that God deals with people in specific times, not to change how he deals with humans each time, but to reveal something about himself. And it's like this big river that gets wider. And our knowledge of Christ grows as we get closer to the cross. Now let's flash back to Abram. Abram's in Genesis 15, what do I do? And God has this ceremony where he, he basically... Um, commits himself to Abram, creates a covenant. There was some shedding of blood, animals died. And he, he basically was signing himself over to commit himself to Abraham. And then Abram, by the time you get to verse, chapter 17, Abram's like, God, I don't have a kid yet. How are you going to bless me? Is Eliezer of Damascus going to be my offspring? He goes, no. He goes, well, God, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do. How are you going to do? How do I know, God? How do I know? So God gave Abram a sign called circumcision. He uh, wanted to, through this covenant, reveal his faithfulness to Abram. He wanted to reveal his grace. He wanted to reveal his mercy. He wanted to communicate these things to, to Abram. And he says, look, I promise to be a God to you and to your children after you. So I'm going to put this sign of the covenant, 
which is circumcision. This sign would pass generation to generation to ensure that God's promise to Abraham was not lost. Because if you read in those chapters, he says, Abraham, you're going to be long gone. They're going to go, your people are going to go into captivity. He tells them about Egypt. He says, they're going to come out. He says, you're going to be long gone before this promise is fulfilled, but your name will not be forgotten. You know, he's sitting up, if, I don't know what you can see and all that, but he's probably up there going, ha, ah, my name is everywhere. No, he's not. But God gave a sign to the community of his people so they would not forget the promise that was given to them. A couple of reasons, really. For their own benefit, for the benefit of the world, to see that they're different, for the glory of God's name, so that when Israel overtakes the land, everybody doesn't go, man, they were really good warriors. No, they go, oh, those are the people of Yahweh. They have the sign of Yahweh. And so God gets the glory for everything they've done because they've rallied around and they've been marked as God's people. So what, we said signs communicate something. What does the sign of circumcision communicate? communicates a lot of things, but one of the things that communicates to the people is that everyone in this community has the hope that your sin will be cut away. If you know what circumcision is, the cutting away of the foreskin, and it's a symbol and a sign and a picture, a visible, tangible thing that the world sees of sin will be in the future cut away by God. Don't know how, don't understand who's going to do it, but they are trusting God to do it, and they're passing that sign generation to generation. God uses signs to ensure that his promise is not lost generation to generation. Okay. Now we come up to the new covenant. You got a new covenant? You got a new sign. God gives every one of these covenants that we talked about, he gives them a sign so that the people don't forget that God has committed himself to them. You see, God's covenants weren't ever really re re revealed and fulfilled within a few days. It's like um, you tell your child, yes, I'll take you to the park next week. Well, within a week, they know if you're faithful or not. But God's covenants were long-lasting, dealt with generations and generations of people. And he gave them a sign, and there's a new sign that had to be given because the new covenant, the old covenant promised that your sin would be cut away. What did Jesus do? He cut away the sins of the people. His death on the cross literally chopped away, cut off, and fulfilled the promise that was made to Abraham. And what was the promise? Abram, this is to you and to your offspring. He says this, in, in, I think it's chapter 17 of Genesis when he's, when he's given circumcision. It could be one of, those different, it's one of those chapters in there. He says, I will, oh, here it is, 17, 8. I will be their God. That was God's commitment, not just to you, Abram, but to those who come after you that live according to this word that are in your offspring. I will be a God to you and I will be a God to them. Who is he going to be a God to? Those who are marked by the sign of circumcision. Now we got a problem here because does that mean all you have to do is be circumcised and you go to heaven? No. Paul explains the spiritual intent behind these things. He says there, you got to think about the outward and the inward. When you um, see a sign that says the youth room, you don't sit in the hallway and go, I'm in the youth room. It's pointing you to where to the location. There's an outward picture of an inward reality. You have to go into the room to experience what the room is. And in the same way, circumcision, there was an outward picture and visible, tangible thing with an inward spiritual reality that was required to receive the benefits of what that sign pointed to. Paul says this in Romans, a Jew, it's not just a Jew because you call, you're born a Jew, not just because you're circumcised, it's a Jew is one inwardly. And the picture of circumcision the actual real circumcision is a matter of the heart, and it's a work of the Spirit on the heart. So Paul is starting to help us understand that these outward signs of these covenants point to a spiritual reality that must take place to receive the benefits of the promise. I will, send, I will take you to heaven if you have faith. 
Here's your sign, baptism. We're going to get to that in a minute. But does baptism save you? By no stretch of the imagination. In the same way that circumcision did not save the people, they were, they were required to be regenerate by the Holy Spirit. They were required to be transformed and renewed. They were required to trust in Jesus Christ. And you go, well, Jesus didn't exist. They had to participate in the sacrificial system to show their trust that God would bring someone who would cut away their sin. So when you think of the new covenant and you think about the sign of the new covenant, which we, um, spoiler alert, is baptism, what is it that God wants to communicate or tell the generations of the church about his covenant. He wants to tell us all about his promise that Christ's death has finally and fully washed away all of our sins. You see, circumcision pointed to a future event of something that you hope would happen. Baptism points back to a completed work, one that has been fulfilled. In seminary, one of the professors said, do you know what the theme of the New Testament was? And he paused so we could all give him wrong answers. And then he said, fulfillment. I thought, man, and it's not the only theme, you know, you could, but he said, fulfillment. Because the, the entirety of the New Testament is trying to explain that all that God promised in the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the sign of that covenant that he made to, with the church in Jesus Christ was, the, was baptism in the Lord's Supper. And they point to a couple of different realities about this. Baptism is entrance into the covenant community. Baptism is an outward sign of God's commitment to wash his people clean. Now, you may have heard um, statements like this if you've grown up in the United States. Baptism is where a believer makes declaration that he or she is a part of the body of Christ through faith in Jesus alone. And part of me wants to say that's a little bit arrogant. <laughs> it's, it's a little offensive to say it that way. But to look at God, who came to us while we were yet his enemies, who died on the cross while we were his enemies, who tracked us down, gave us a new heart, transformed us, and then to say the sign is about what I've done? It's about God and what he's done and what he's doing. It's a sign to us of God's faithful commitment to us. What is the rainbow? It's a sign of God's commitment so that we look and we remember God. But more importantly, he said, I'm going to put this bow in the cloud. That when it starts raining, I will remember. So it's assurance to us that God will remember his covenant promise. So baptism then is assurance to us that God will remember all of those in this covenant community who have been washed clean by baptism and have the inward reality of regeneration of the heart. We will be counted among the numbers of those in the eternal kingdom with him. God is making a declaration that he will redeem those washed inwardly by faith. So baptism is not a sign of my commitment. It's a sign of God's commitment to us. That's very important. It's a very important distinction. And it changes how you understand the, everything about it. But there's one thing, too, um, I was supposed to show you that. I had that written down. So if you, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of the younger people like to copy it down, so I'm going to give them a second. Baptism is an outward sign of God's commitment to wash his people clean. Um, but that's not the only thing baptism is. Baptism is also, it's a sign with, with power. We call it a sign and a seal. This is where people get a little tripped up and you start to go, hey, hey wait a minute. So how, what's God's ordinary means of saving people? Ordinarily, if you go down to the very basics, someone's born into a Christian home, brought into the Christian community. If you're Presbyterian, you understand they are entered into as members of the church through baptism because the sign of the covenant is placed upon them. The sign of the covenant is not they've received the benefits of God's promise, but that they stand within the community that will receive the benefits of God's promise. And every one of those who have faith in Christ will receive the benefits of that promise. 
So the sign is placed upon the community. The child enters in. They're trained by the church. They're trained by their parents. And then they come up one day and they go, I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. I trust and I believe. And then they are admitted to the Lord's table. Because the Lord's table, you come by faith. Your own personal, individual faith. That's the ordinary means by which God saves someone. And that's why Christ commanded it in Matthew 28. He didn't just say, you know, y'all go make disciples and probably a good idea to, to baptize them. It's a great marketing tool because the world will start to see the baptized people and they might want to be a part of it. Y'all can use it as a marketing tool. That's not what God, Jesus said at all. He gave us a command to go forth and baptize, make disciples and baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because what we believe to be happening in baptism is it's, it's something beyond just a sign, but it also seals us into the graces of God. And that's why baptism is not to be ignored. If you are here today and you claim Christ and you have not yet been baptized, then the scriptures would say you're living in disobedience to God and you ought to come running forward to be baptized. So if that's you, you don't want to run forward right now, which I probably would not, talk to me afterwards. Talk to one of the elders. Understand where you stand and why, what it would take to, to come forth and receive the sign and seal of baptism. But it's Christ's command that everyone in the covenant community would be baptized. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is our one of our um, constitutional documents for this church, says this in chapter 28. The grace promised in baptism, is not only offered, so we've already talked about it, it's a sign tell, helping us to set us apart and, and as a visible representation of God's promise, but it says it's not only offered, but it's really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost. <coughs> That's a lot of words, but what it's saying is that in baptism, something's actually happening beyond just us all going, oh, I see the picture of God and the, the picture of salvation. He's saying the Holy Spirit of God, or the Westminster Confession is saying, we believe the scripture to teach that the Spirit of God is actually using your baptism as part of your plan and train for salvation. You go, well, that's weird. Does that mean the baby's saved when they get baptized? No. The Westminster Confession says that God is publicly giving his grace to the one who uh, is baptized. But it also goes on to say this, the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered. That's why we say it's a sacramentum, it's a mystery. Because God is using this ordinarily in people's lives as a part of drawing them and saving them and working in them. But he doesn't necessarily save them at the moment they're baptized. There are those who would teach baptismal regeneration where the actual sprinkling of water by a, a pastor would actually physically clean, cleanse the sins of the, of the young person. And that's not what we're proclaiming. What we're saying is we don't know how God uses it exactly. We can't describe it in, in words that we would all understand. It's a mystery. But scriptures are very clear that it's more than just a mental activity where we go, it's not, it's not advertising. It's not a marketing ploy. It is a, a, a real thing that God uses and, and he, he uses it, and then we just obey. We obey, and we do it. And God says, when you do this, my people, the word will pass, and the promise will pass from generation to generation, and it will be for your glory, for my glory, and for your benefit. The communicants coming today, four of them have been baptized in infancy. And they are looking back today, knowing that God used their baptism to bring them to this point of personal faith in Jesus Christ. And it is upon their own personal faith and trust in Christ that they are admitted to partake of his body and blood. You see, baptism, Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller said this, is not merely a personal, individual experience. He says, we are a community, and the sacraments show that we belong to this community. Just like the Auburn and Alabama logos that I showed earlier or the Star of David to Israel, you identify with those things, and that's a community of people that rally around a certain set of beliefs and ideas. The Westminster Confession goes on to say this, that, that the, the sacraments put a visible difference between those that belong to the church and the rest of the world. So it's a sign and it's a seal. God puts his stamp on us, and that stamp says that if you believe 
you will be saved. The church, God's people, his covenant community, we are citizens of his kingdom, signified and sealed in both baptism and community. Baptism is entrance in, communion is the ongoing evidence that we are still in the covenant. One guy online already, he put it is a great way to put this. It's like the the wedding kiss. When the man is told to kiss his bride, it seals the deal. They've just made a commitment before all the witnesses. When you are at a wedding, you are witnessing before God that this is a holy matrimony that he approves of. And you're witnesses of the commitment they've made to one another. And when that man grabs that woman in front of all the witnesses and seals his commitment, it's a, I love you, I commit myself to you, let me show you with a visible, physical sign. All the potential suitors in that room know that the woman is no longer available. You can say all you want, but the kiss is that final sealing before the witnesses. And here's the thing. The woman who's a part of that marriage, she received that sign. She received it differently than everybody else. It was warm. It was a comfort. It was an assurance. It was a joy. It was like no other kiss that she's probably ever had. And that kiss, given daily, is a reminder that keeps her heart close to the man. I trust him because he loves me. He cares for me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. A visible, tangible sign. The kiss didn't do anything. The kiss was a visible, tangible sign of the inward reality of the man's heart. And the woman receives it and accepts it. So, sacraments. I don't know if I can say this, but they serve as sort of a kiss from God. It's a reminder to us regularly and consistently that he loves us and he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. It shows his ongoing commitment to love us. It shows that God's loving, gracious kindness extends to all who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we will observe a baptism. It's not just a sentimental act. It is God working in his people, reminding you of the love that he has for you, reminding these children of the love he has for them, drawing us closer and more deeply into a relationship with him so that we are not lost. Because Jesus told us, I will lose none of those whom the Father has given me. Let's pray. Father, what a great joy it is to be part of your kingdom. What a great joy it is to watch these young people come this morning to receive the sign and seal of the kingdom and to commit their faith and, and, and oh God, what a joy this is going to be. Thank you for it. Thank you for your the sacraments. And we pray that we would never forget the power in them, but know that you are at work in them, continually loving us through them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.